Hey there, welcome to Sylphon Path. This is the deep dive part 2 on my Red Komodo 6K digital cinema camera. In part 1 I went quite deep into what's on the outside of the camera. In this video be prepared for even a deeper dive into software on this tiny little cine beast as I will touch on every single menu option and setting currently available in beta firmware version 122. If you are into this kind of stuff, you should have a blast, otherwise please check the timestamps in the description below so that you can jump into the part you actually care about. I hope you're ready, the video is over 52 minutes long so there should be something for everyone in it. And as always, if you find it useful, please feel free to like and subscribe. It really means a lot to me and every single comment makes me want to make more videos for you. Without further ado, enjoy. As soon as the system boots up, we're greeted with this default screen. Considering it is such a tiny screen, it has a vast amount of useful information on it, together with shortcuts to most commonly used settings here at the bottom. At the very top we have the red logo, which doubles as the main menu button. Pressing it or pressing this menu button takes you to the same place. It is nice that they are both here since some people prefer touch controls while others like me prefer more tactile real buttons instead. Next to it is the status bar. Just like on any other operating system, it displays the most important system information. We have the status of our CFast 2.0 memory card. Since it's green, it means it is present and it shows us how much time we have left in hours and minutes. So we have 1 hour and 2 minutes of record time left. T and E are very important temperature and exposure indicators on all RED cameras. You do not want to start shooting until both T and E are green. If your T or sensor temperature doesn't change to green after 30 seconds to a minute of turning the camera on, it most likely means it's time for you to recalibrate or black shade the sensor. I'll dive into what all of that means and how it's done later on, but just remember, you do not want to start shooting until T and E are both green. Shooting when T and E are not in a ready state may result in suboptimal footage quality, noisy image, or even some hot pixels showing up in your footage, which while fixable could ruin your day. Timecode, genlock, and sync indicators would light up if you have the optional RED expander module and external devices are hooked up to its ports. The 3D LUT indicator simply tells you if the image you are seeing on the monitor, either the LCD screen in this case or the SDI attached monitor, has the 3D LUT applied to it. If you're shooting in RED RAW like we are here, LUTs like ISO and white balance for example are just metadata. However, if you're shooting in ProRes format, depending on your settings, which we will touch on later, the LUT may actually be baked in, so it's good to see the indicator present right here in the status bar. Next to it, we have this checkmark box inside a little outline of a Komodo. This indicates if all other temperature sensor readings on the Komodo are ok, things like motherboard, ASIC, etc. If the checkbox is green, you're good to go. If not, make sure you're not blocking the intake or the exhaust fan of the Komodo. Padlock icon is open in our case, and it indicates the touchscreen is not locked. We can make changes to settings. If we press up and down buttons for a quick second, we can lock the LCD screen and prevent any accidental changes to our settings. One more quick press on the unlock screen and we're back to business. Do know that the screen is not force touch sensitive, so pressing around with this Apple Pencil does nothing. It is capacitive touch, therefore you have to use fingers in order to make changes. Like if I wanted to autofocus here on this display in the background, or onto the road mic here, I can do it with just a finger. Next is the Wi-Fi icon indicator. Since it is white and not gray, it means Wi-Fi is turned on. And the little Thunderbolt icon indicates if we have power coming from the DC in port. In our case, we have nothing connected there. And lastly, the two battery icons right here indicate the battery status of Komodo's left and right BP9 battery respectively. In my case here, the left battery is pretty much almost depleted and soon it will actually switch to using the right battery. Right below the status bar, we have the viewfinder. This shows us the image Komodo sees and helps us in framing the scene. If you have a supported EF lens with autofocus, you can even touch focus the screen as I showed you earlier. LCD can also show much more useful information. If you tap these stop lights, you will get into the LCD submenu, where you can enable or disable guides, like so. And you can set these guides to whatever you want in the settings menu as I will show you later. Or enable or disable tools, 
like focus assist, peaking, edge focus, or even false color in either exposure or video modes. Komodo also supports two sets of zebras, which you can enable or disable by setting them in the settings menu. The cool thing is though, that you can control the guides and tools separately for the built-in LCD and for the SDI connected monitor. Another useful feature is being able to punch in or zoom on your image so that you can get the focus easier. And you can punch in separately on LCD and the SDI external monitor. Back in the main view, the three stoplights we just touched on are red signature over and under exposure indicators. Looking at them, and if you click on the clip to activate the histogram, you can immediately get confirmation if you're clipping any shadows or highlights and by how much. For example, if I just cover the sensor, you can clearly see that we are now clipping our shadows. This indicator does not actually care about your ISO setting or the white balance or anything, as those are just metadata when shooting in red raw. Rather, it is concerned only with your iris and shutter speed, in other words, your true exposure. Next to the histogram, we have the audio controls, and these actually show channel 1 and 2 of our internal mic and channel 3 and 4 of the external mic. Tapping the audio meters gets you quick access to Komodo's audio controls. For example, since I do not have an external mic connected, let's enable internal microphones. As you will see in the detail settings later on, you can even set different gain on different channels. The big red button, in my case labeled A, though you can change that to anything from A to Z, is of course the record button. Tapping it starts the recording. I like how Komodo indicates recording in progress. The button is bright red color and there are two bars on top and the bottom of our viewfinder indicating that the camera is recording. There is even a tiny little red dot right next to the red logo as well. Pressing the button one more time will stop the recording. At the very bottom, we have access to commonly used settings, like the frame rate we are shooting at. Since we are in 6K here, we have 2398 and 3996, for example. If we were in 4K, we could go up to 60 frames per second, and in 2K, as high as 120. ISO settings are right next to it. ISO settings on Komodo go from 250 to 12,800. However, the default ISO is 800. Electronic iris control for compatible EF lenses can go as high as low as your lens is allowed. In my case here, we are at f5.2, however, we can go as far as this lens allowed, which is 22.6, and as low as it allows, which is 2.8. For now, I'll just keep it somewhere around here. The shutter angle of 180 degrees is usually the best default setting for pleasing video shot at 23.98 frames per second, but you can set it anywhere from one degree to 360 degrees. If you prefer to see this setting in time mode or change the increments from one quarter stop to one third, you can do so in the menu and I will show that later on. And lastly, the white balance. Just like the ISO, the white balance is just a metadata setting. It's useful to set so that you can see the image the way you intend to shoot it. However, you can change this later on in the post whenever you want to, as long as you're shooting in red raw. The options for white balance can be set as temperature in Kelvin anywhere from 1700 Kelvin to 10,000. However, you can also change this shortcut, so instead of temperature display like this, it can actually show you presets instead, like daylight, tungsten, cloudy, and other usual presets that you find on many cameras out there. Touching this tile changes from histogram to clip info. Clip info shows us the file name, the time, which can be time code or edge code, duration, which is the elapsed time for the clip if you are in the recording mode, and the format and the resolution we are filming at. In our case, 6K 17 to 9 aspect ratio in red raw, LQ, which is the highest compression mode, at 23.98 frames per second. When you tap on the status bar itself, you will actually get a quick status of every single thing on the camera, from your clip info to battery, to camera information, your project settings, lens, Wi-Fi, and full camera temperature info. And clicking on any one of these will actually take you to that option in the menu. So if I click on a clip count, we'll go to the media menu. And if I go here, for example, to the lens info, we'll jump into the lens configuration and settings. 
So this is just a quick jump. So instead of going through menu and having to figure out where you want to go, hitting the status bar at the very top, you can actually select the section you want. Do know that in this uh, version of the beta software, as in all the previous one, this is actually the only place in the camera where it's kind of laggy, like the touch screen is just super laggy here. Uh, and it's simply because it just has way too much information. I'm sure that they will figure out a better way to actually manage this so that it can be smooth scrolling. For now, it's very laggy. However, you can use your buttons again. And as you can see with buttons, things are always much, much better. Now let's go through Komodo's main menu. I'm actually going to start at the very end and then we're going to work our way up. So under maintenance, this is where you can actually go to calibrate your camera. If you click this, you can actually go and make sure to cover the sensor of the camera with your uh, cap and black shade the sensor. So you will actually go hit OK and in about a minute and a half, the camera will go through the process of calibrating your sensor and making sure that your footage comes out really great after that. Then you also have different options for calibration. You can actually select the factory calibration of what Red had it uh, set to when they were calibrating it in the factory or user, which is your own user run calibration. In the future versions of firmware, we're most likely to be able to see some other calibrations. I'm pretty sure that Red will allow us to save multiple different calibrations so you can have per location or per set calibration, especially if the temperature changes in uh, between those locations. You can also save the log. This will save an encrypted text file onto the camera's CFast 2.0 card, and then you can send it to Red in case you encountered a bug or anything like that. You can of course reset the defaults for all the settings that you have changed and you can perform a full factory reset of the camera as well, which will return it to the out of the box kind of experience. And you can choose the upgrade option, which we went through earlier when we upgraded the firmware. Then as far as the language goes, for now, these are the options you have. Of course, English, simplified Chinese, French, German, Japanese, and Spanish. I'm pretty sure more languages are coming, but for now, this is what the beta 122 supports. Under system settings, you can of course set your date and time and your time zone. And then you can control your lens. Here it detects that the focal length of our Canon EF lens is 40 millimeters. It knows its focusing distance. All of this information is actually gathered from the data that the lens actually sends to the camera. However, we can go and set the iris ourselves. So if we want to change the iris to something else, this is where you would do it. Or when you are on the home screen, as you recall, you can just tap on this and switch the iris to whatever setting you want. If you put some kind of manual lens, you will not see the iris control. You will, of course, be setting it manually on the lens itself. So if we go back here, this lens does not have image stabilization, so it's showing us as not available. So Komodo knows how to read all this data. Even though Komodo does not have IBIS in body image stabilization, the lenses that do have it will, of course, be able to benefit from it. Then we have the fan control. Komodo is such a tiny body, and I guess it's very well designed with this channel right down the middle here where it sucks air and uh, exhausts it through this side that you can actually just keep it on quiet and it never really interferes with your footage. If you go to adaptive, it actually will adapt based on the temperatures of the sensor, of the ASIC and everything else. It monitors the temperature sensors on the camera and it will spin them up and down depending on how the temperature is uh, going on. However, if you set it to quiet, it's probably the best setting because you will be always assured that it's quiet and it will only really ramp up when it has to. Under power, we can actually see the voltages of everything that Komodo can receive uh, power from. So like our DC, we can actually see the battery one, battery two. It even shows us that remaining time if your batteries are actually the Canon BPs that can send that information. And then we also have at the very end the power out option. So if the DC in is plugged in and power out is on, it will trickle charge your Canon BP batteries. It takes about eight hours to charge them. So it's not the fastest way of charging your BP batteries, but it's nice to have. Under indicators, you can actually set the tally light at the front if you want it on and off while you're recording or not. 
And then for the status setting, this is where you can change how you display your quick options. Like for example, here in the main menu, we have shutter in degrees. So if you actually wanted to go and change that from angle to time, you could actually switch that, go back, and now you can see our shutter is actually displayed in time values instead of degrees. So let's go back. I like it personally in angle because I'm shooting video on this and not photos. You can also choose if you like quarter of a stop in your aperture increments or if you would like a third of a stop. I like more control, so quarter of a stop is good for me. For the focusing distance, you can just choose imperial or metric if you are in, you know, feet or meters. And then for the white balance mode, you can choose your white balance in Kelvin or in the presets. So right now here, we have it set as Kelvin, so when we click this, we have to know the temperature that we kind of want. However, if you really don't know what all of those temperatures mean and you're more noob like me, you may want to go and switch this to presets. So now when you come here, you actually have daylight, cloudy, shade, and all of those options, which are a little bit more limited. However, probably easier to understand for most common scenes out there. So it's really your preference, but it's nice that you can select this and kind of go in between the modes. And then under system status, we can actually see the camera info. It tells us what the camera is. The pin is really kind of serial number. Uh, the version of the firmware we are on and the current runtime of the camera Komodos don't just measure runtime of the sensor shooting an image. They actually measure the uptime. So the moment you turn on the camera, it starts measuring time. So this little guy has been up and running for 28 hours. And then you can see the temperature sensor info. So if we go here, the good status here indicates this little check mark, as I mentioned earlier. And then we can see the individual temperatures, which together make this status either be good or, or bad or whatever. So we have two logic boards, the power board, STM, and the sensor. So if we go back here, this is it for the system settings. There isn't anything else to be done. We can go to communication. So here under camera settings, you can actually name your camera. So when you open your application on the iPhone or the iPad, this is the name of the camera that shows up over there. And then you can go and configure your Wi-Fi settings. Currently, I'm in an ad hoc mode where the Komodo acts as a wireless router itself. So my phone can connect directly to Komodo and then I open Red Control app in order to control the camera. In this mode, the settings you have is the name of the wireless network that your Komodo will be advertising. So mine is Stormtrooper 911 for the serial number 911 that mine has. Passphrase, you set some kind of password. Mine is very simple, of course, just so I can connect quickly. And then you set the band. Setting the band is very important because if you want to be showing live video through your Red Control app, you would ideally want to set this to five gigahertz. If you just want to run controls and maybe go further away from the camera, that's where you do the 2.4 gigahertz mode. So five gigahertz has a shorter range and it can't go like really through many walls, if any, especially coming from this little antenna. However, it will send you the video to your iPhone or iPad. 2.4 can go through many more walls and you can control it from much farther away. However, it's not ideal if you want to be seeing the live image from the camera so keep that in mind and then when it comes to channel you can really set any channel you want on these particular bands um, there are iPhone and Android apps on your phones where you can see the channel saturation of the Wi-Fi devices around you so you would probably want to pick the channel that is not being overutilized and oversubscribed in my case right here at home 161 seems to be the least used so I just picked 161 uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you can just leave the default setting, whatever it is. And if you are experiencing any connectivity issues or laggy image on your iPhone when you are viewing the image, you can actually go and change this channel until you get the one that is not causing you any problems. Um, of course, we have the WPA2 encryption enabled. This cannot even be disabled or changed, which is good. And the status is showing connected. That's why our little Wi-Fi icon here is white and not grayed out. And then if we go here to the mode, we can of course go and disable it fully or change it to the infrastructure mode. This is great if you already have Wi-Fi on set or at home and you want to simply use devices that are already on that network to control your Komodo. So you can then go to the infrastructure mode, hit SSID, 
and then you will have to enter the name of the wireless network that you want to connect. Typing on this tiny screen is not the easiest thing in the world. So it really takes a very steady finger to actually type anything in here properly. I'm going to enter the passphrase. And then you can hit connect. And then the camera will go into Wi-Fi connecting mode. So you can see the status changing to connecting. You can see the little wireless icon changed from being an antenna to being a little usual icon that we are used to. And we are connected. So now the camera is on Wi-Fi at home and I can control it from my phones and iPads that are on that network. Or I can go to any computer on my Wi-Fi network and simply open the browser to the IP address that this camera actually has. You can find it on your router or if you click in the settings here, you can go and see that you are in an infrastructure mode, connected to Amplify Network, status is connected, and this is your IP address. If you open the browser to this IP 172.2.9.2.9.194, you will get red control right in your browser. And then you also have serial connectivity. This is just external connectivity through the expander port where you can control the camera using the serial port. The next setting up is the autofocus. So if the lens you have on your camera supports autofocus and the little button is set to AF, this menu item will be enabled. If it is sent to MF, it will actually be disabled because you're in manual focus mode. So make sure that you have a lens attached which supports autofocus and it is an EF lens and your AF button is actually selected. In that case, you will be able to go into the autofocus mode and choose the options. The first option is to enable or disable autofocus. It's pretty much equivalent of pressing the AF or MF button on your lens, however done electronically. Then you have the autofocus mode. Do you want a continuous autofocus or would you like a single shot autofocus where you just tap to focus and then it stays locked in, in that space? If we choose single and jump back to this screen, you will see that wherever I click, it will just stay there. So even if I move my camera, the focus will actually stay in that mode. However, if we go into continuous, don't forget to actually start the autofocus because if you exit at this point in time and try to point your camera, continuous autofocus will not actually be turned on. So you will think like, well, I set it into continuous mode. It doesn't work. What's going on? Well, you can either initiate the autofocus in continuous mode by tapping on the screen or right after setting it into continuous mode, you want to actually start the autofocus. And then when you go a turn around and about, it will actually be scanning and focusing properly. So here we're focusing on the road mic. Here's the monitor in the background. Here's my iPad. The monitor again. Road monitor road. Actually, the autofocus is extremely usable considering it is in a complete beta and even red says that you should not rely on it in any way. It actually works really well for me, especially with this cheapo 40 millimeter lens from Canon. It works wonderful. Another thing you can change in the autofocus is the size of the autofocus square. Uh, so currently we have it set as large. For example, you could go and set small. And as you can see, this little tiny square for autofocusing becomes really tiny. Now, on Komodo, considering this screen is really, really small and the autofocus is still in beta, uh, I would highly recommend keeping this as large. It is pretty much as big as the thumbprint of your finger. So wherever you touch, it will usually be right in the center of your finger. So. There we go. It's, it's like very easy to do it when it's large. Um, you can, of course, make it even bigger and you can even choose different uh, aspect ratios. Like it can be wide or vertical. So let's do a wide one here. So now it's wide. It's not a square. It's actually a little wider. So whatever you want, by default, I keep mine on large and it works amazingly well. Now, when it comes to position, this is just the position where you want autofocus to actually be on the screen. You can go and set pre-programmed positions like right, lower right, top right, center, bottom center, and all of those. Like if you wanted it on the left, well, now it will be on the left. And if we go back in here and we say we want it in center bottom, well, now it's in center bottom. However, as soon as you touch to change it, the setting actually ends up being changed to custom. 
So this is kind of a nice preset of where you want your focus to be maybe when you turn on the camera or for your settings that you're saving as presets as I will show you later on. However, don't really rely that it's gonna stay there forever, especially if you touch the screen. So that's out of focus. It's again, extremely usable considering that not only the firmware is in beta, but they even say the out of focus uh, algorithms are completely in super, super early stages. Then we have the presets that I just mentioned a moment ago. In the presets, you can actually go and create your own presets for every single setting in the camera. So one thing that I have in my saved presets, you will see here in camera presets, is I have a default all. This guy actually sets every single setting on the camera the way I want it. And then the other custom presets like 6K maximum resolution, 6K full frame 29.97, or maybe 2K 79 slow-mo, those will only change my project settings. But the camera, all the default settings that I usually like will be set here. And those presets can be very highly customizable on Komodo, much more so than on any other camera I have ever encountered. So not only can you select all settings and checkbox for every single Komodo setting to be saved as a preset, you can actually just go and override specific ones. Like for example, if you want a preset that just enables your LUT, well, you can go and select only that. So when you select this particular preset, it selects the LUT. Instead of you going into the menu, choosing the LUT, you could maybe program your LUT in a preset. So it's extremely powerful. I'm not gonna go through all of this because we are literally going through every single menu option right now while I'm showing you this video. Every single thing we touch on, you can actually set as a specific setting on your particular preset. I mean, this, this thing is never ending. It is absolutely phenomenal. Another cool thing is that you have your in-camera presets. So whenever you create a preset, it saves it in the camera. And these are mine that I just saved. I can delete them, apply them, export them. However, you also have on media presets. So these are the ones that I backed up. So when you go to your in-camera presets, you can click export all or export a specific one that is selected and save that preset on the memory card so that you can take it to another Komodo or just back it up onto your computer. So in case that you ever format this camera and lose your presets, you can actually get them back in. Because once you go to on media presets, any one of those or all of them, you can also import. So that's really, really nicely done. This is the media menu that uh, allows you to eject your memory card uh, gracefully without uh, causing any file corruption or anything like that. As I mentioned, that's what you would want to do, but the reality of the thing is that all of us just simply pop the card and, you know, go on with our day. Uh, media info provides you the information on the memory card that is inside, the capacity, how much space we have left in the percentage, as well as in the record time. So right now, one minute, two seconds. And then the secure format allows you to set your camera ID and position, your real number, your edge code usually starts at one hour and it goes up from there, and then allows you to format the camera with these settings. These settings actually dictate the clip names or the file names of your camera. So if you can see my camera is set as camera A and the position is A and the real number is eight. Nice thing is that this real number increments every time you format the memory card in the Komodo. But when you go back to the home screen, you can actually see what this correlates to. Here we have the clip name. So if I hit record, our clip will be named A007, A058. A and A correspond to your camera ID and the position. 8 would be the next real number if we format the camera now. So that means that the current real number is 7. So if you come back here, you see AA007, clip number 58. So it's a very nice way to kind of name your stuff. If you are, for example, Gerald Undone, you could go and put your camera ID to G and your camera position to U, and it would be G007U058. And then whenever you record something, the next one simply becomes the next one, 59. So that's where you set actually the settings on how your files are named. Now, when we go to monitoring, this is where you can configure different settings for what's displayed on your monitors, either it being LCD or the SDI attached monitor. And also the live stream, which is the live stream of your viewfinder being shot directly over Wi-Fi to your iPhone or iPad. 
And then you also have your tools and framing guides. The LCD is what we see on this particular LCD. So if we go into settings, we can change the brightness. I keep mine at 100%, by default it comes as 80. Then you can actually choose if you want to see your image and LUT, or if you want to see your footage in the pure red wide gamut log 3G10 format. So see how it looks a little bit washed out there? That's red white color gamut. However, if we say image or a LUT, the image processing pipeline is now applied on this. And then you can turn on guides and tools. And the same thing you can actually do when you actually click on this. This is where you can go and turn on your LCD guides. So watch these lines that I have around. If I tap this, they disappear. If I tap it again, they're there. And then you also have your LCD tools. So for example, if I select edge, focus, it's displayed. However, if I turn the LCD tools off, the edge focus is gone. So I can also do the same thing with false color. False color is on. I don't have to turn off false color. I can just turn off tools as in general and it will turn them on and off. So that's actually the same settings here. Since I turned off tools, you see it as off. I can turn it on here and the same goes for guides. So this is just a menu where you can set this. However, it's much easier to manage those by tapping these uh, semaphore icons and then go through this. Now, when we go through the SDI, this is very similar to the previous menu. However, we can choose what the resolution is that Komodo will be sending over the SDI port. In my case, I have 2K DCI, but you can go anywhere from 1080p to 4K DCI as well as UHD. And then what frequency is the video signal coming out of the SDI port? In my case, it's 2398, but you can actually go as high as 60 frames per second, or to be more precise, 5994. And then you choose what do you want Komodo to send to the monitor attached to the SDI, similar as how we had it on the LCD. You could send red, white, gamma directly to the monitor so that you can apply maybe monitor built-in tools to change the image or apply LUTs, or you can send the IPP2 image pipeline or a lot to be sent directly to the monitor. And again, you have guides, tools, and you can choose the overlay. Now, the guides and tools we talked about, and you can manage the SDI guides and tools again from here. There is SDI guides, SDI tools. So by clicking here, you can enable and disable them while you're quickly shooting or setting up your frame. However, if you go to the menu options, you have a couple more options. This is very useful if you're using your external monitor for monitoring purposes and not necessarily recording purposes. So if you have a Ninja 5 and you want to record the video coming from RED, you want your overlay to be off. However, if you just want to monitor things and you want to be able to see specific settings and information from RED directly on your secondary monitor, then you would want to enable it. And the tools can be actually in advanced mode or simple mode. So you can choose that. Now, when it comes to live stream, this setting here allows us to enable or disable live streaming to iPhone or Apple or even our web browser if we are accessing the camera through those means. You can enable or disable live stream and you can choose the quality factor. So if you're having issues and your high is very jittery image and it's not producing a very nice and smooth image for you to watch or maybe focus off of, you could go and change it to medium or low. However, I keep it on high because I want the best possible quality even on my iPhone when I'm remotely viewing the, the stream. And then you have, as I mentioned, different tools. There is false color, which can be enabled. And then you have the exposure and video modes. And then you can also enable peaking when you can choose between focus, edge, or the peaking here. And of course, the color of the peaking, peaking provides. So here we have green, and you can see that things that are in focus are peaking with the green color. Now, again, you can click on this and change these settings through here or enable and disable the LCD tools altogether. But there is of course a dedicated menu where you can do that as well. Another thing you have is log view. So you can enable or disable the log view. And then you have your zebras if you wanna set them up. You can choose your IREs high and low and then you can have two sets of zebras so that you can nicely monitor your focus and exposure. And then in the guides, this is where you can set up up to three frame guides on your Komodo. So if you go here, we can enable or disable this particular guide. And as you can see, my very first guide is a full 100% scale of the sensor itself. And it's solid white at 50% of opacity. So that's this one. 
The very outline being in white is my very first frame guide. If you don't want that one, you don't have to have it, but I like my image outline so I know where the edge is because if I'm recording something with, with a dark background, I won't be able to tell if we are out of frame, like somewhere here, or if we are still in frame. But with the guide, you can clearly tell where the sensor ends. Another uh, guide that I personally have is 16 by nine. Uh, because full frame on Komodo is 17 to 9 aspect ratio. I do like seeing also a 16 to 9 aspect ratio in 100% real scale with a dashed white of 50% opacity. So if you look at my image, this, this little line that is right in here, that's 16 to 9 aspect ratio. And then you can set any other guys that you want. So I have these two. However, a cool thing is that you can also have another one. So for example, if I want a four by three guide, you can actually scale it 90% or 100. So I like things to be 100% because I like to account for the whole real image. You can choose your line style. So we can say, you know what, let's do just a bracket on this one. So we'll only see the corners of it. And we will actually go and say, this one's gonna be yellow and opacity 50 is good. So now this four by three guide is actually here. You could, since we chose edge, we actually see the little edges sticking out and this will be our four by three aspect ratio. So now this is a nice guide where you go shooting. You know that if you want to deliver your video in four by three, you better stick within these guides. And then lastly, you have the center guide. Center guide is really just the icon right in the middle, right? So mine is cross green at 50%. And you can change that to be cross or small dot or a medium dot, uh, different color, different opacity. But that's actually this guy right here. So this little center icon, so you always know where the center of your shot is at. Now, green is sometimes maybe hard to see, especially if you're shooting on white. You can go back here and you can say, you know what? I want opacity to maybe be 100%, so no transparency. And I would like it to be red. So now when we go back, it's much easier to see on white. And it's also very good to be seen on black. So maybe I'll actually leave it as red for now. So that's the monitoring tools. Those are the options you have. LCD, the inbuilt LCD, SDI for what's coming out of the SDI itself. Um, live stream, what's going directly to your iPhone or iPad using the red control app. And then you can control your tools and guides right here. All right, now with that menu item done, let's go to audio and time code. So if we go here for audio source on Komodo, you can choose none for recording no audio, internal microphone, the two internal mics I mentioned in the last video, or the external mic you have connected over three and a half millimeter jack. So we'll select internal microphones for now. And when the internal mics are selected, the internal audio section is actually enabled. So you can set the gain here for your internal mics. You can go anywhere from negative 52 and a half decibel to plus 36 decibel. I personally keep my internal mics on Komodo at 30 decibel because it seems that it provides the best usable scratch audio that I can get. They seem to be very low gain, so I had to boost them up all the way up to 30. You can also link your left and right gain, but you don't have to. If you wanted to set this one to 30 decibels and this one maybe to 15, you could actually do that. And that way you have some kind of protection in case your audio is too loud on one channel or not loud enough on the other. Personally for me, I use external mics. I just leave this one linked and actually disable it. So when we select the external microphone, the internal audio becomes disabled and now we have the external audio settings. And as you can tell, they're absolutely the same. So for my mic, I actually leave it at zero decibels. I don't want any gain from the camera itself because I have a powered mic and it controls its own gain. And again, you can link your left and right gain or you can separate them. When it comes to headphones, you can plug in headphones in a three and a half millimeter jack right here on the side of the Komodo. You can enable the headphones or disable and you can decide what volume should be on your headphones. Currently mine is set to 80 and you can just go and change that right here in the menu. A nice thing is that all of these audio settings that I just mentioned are accessible directly from the home screen. So if you are here, if you just tap onto these audio meters, you actually have direct access to disabling all mics, enabling internal ones, enabling external ones, and setting the gain to exactly where you want it. 
and you can also control your headphone jack right here and the volume on your headphones. So this is probably much easier way to access audio controls. However, as with everything else on this Komodo camera, there is of course a dedicated menu for it as well. And then last, we have the time code source. You can actually use the time on the camera itself as your uh, time code source, or you can use an external time code through the expansion port module that I mentioned earlier. And if you need to jam the time code to the time of day, you can just hit this and it's done. The second to last menu item on Komodo is project settings. The first option is the format. This is how big of an area of a sensor you're using to record your video. By default, the maximum Red Komodo can shoot in is 6K 17 to 9 aspect ratio. You can choose to go lower than this to 6K 2.4 to 1, 6K 16.9, 5K 17.9, 4K 17.9, and 2K 17.9. More resolutions and formats are actually coming soon. Since this is just a beta version, they have added only the most commonly used ones, but I'm pretty sure we will see all kinds of different aspect ratios here. Choosing your recording frame rate is how fast is the footage. So usually for the best video motion blur, you shoot in 2398. However, when shooting in 6K 17 to 9, you can actually click here and go as high as 3996 on Komodo. If you lower your resolution to say 4K 17.9, you can actually then go even higher frame rates. So now we have other frame rates enabled like 47.95 and 59.94. So shooting 4K 60 is possible on Komodo. If we go even further down to 2K 17 to 9, we're windowing down on the sensor, we can actually go even higher frame rate. So Komodo can actually go to 71.93, 95.9, and 119.88 frames per second, or really 120 FPS. No matter what settings you choose here, this project time base actually dictates the playback speed of the video. So while the Komodo will shoot in 2K 79 at 120 frames per second, at 120 frames per second, this is what the final file will actually be saved as. And here you can choose 23.98 frames per second, 24, 25, 2997, 30, 50, 5994, and 60 FPS. So one thing that is weird to me is that you cannot actually go and choose to shoot your frame rate at 120 frames per second and save it as 120 frames per second. You actually can save it as a maximum of 60 FPS. One thing that you may have noticed was that when we changed our project time base, our recording frame rates changed as well. So Komodo actually likes to match these two. So if we go here and change this to 2997, the Komodo will actually change your recording frame rate to match the project time base. So just be careful with that because you may have wanted to go and record 120 frames per second and then decided that you want to save the final output at 60 frames per second. And then you go shoot and you end up with only 60 frames per second footage because Komodo will actually change your recording frame rate once you change the time base. So be careful with that so that you are aware that that's happening. Now, when it comes to choosing the file format, this is actually a very important setting. If you got the Komodo, you probably want to shoot in red raw all the time. If you really want to shoot in ProRes, trust me, there are much more affordable cameras that can shoot and deliver your video in ProRes than Komodo. The real benefit of getting Komodo outside of this format and outside of the quality and everything else is to actually shoot in red raw. I will show you the ProRes settings later on because selecting ProRes actually requires camera to reboot fully. And I actually like that that is the case because this way you will never accidentally choose ProRes when you meant to shoot in Red Raw and vice versa. When your file format is set to R3D, you have different options for quality and quality is really just compression ratios. Don't think of this as like this is going to be high quality and a medium quality and a low quality image. LQ provides phenomenal footage uh, that is on par with MQ and HQ in some instances. For example, when you're doing an interview and nothing is changing in the background. However, it provides you much more storage space because the compression is much higher. So the rule of thumb when it comes to Komodo is that you should probably shoot in LQ most of the time and benefit from the most amount of space available on your memory card and then switch to MQ and potentially HQ 
the more detailed your scene becomes. If you're shooting in a forest and there is a bunch of leaves and whatnot, shoot in HQ. If you're shooting a semi-busy scene where maybe there's a person walking to a car, that would be something for an MQ. An LQ is pretty much for everything else in between, especially things like interviews and whatnot. Especially things like interviews or long running shots of a same scene that doesn't change much in the background. I personally shoot in LQ most of the time. And then when I'm literally in a forest or doing some super highly detailed shots, I will switch to MQ. HQ should really be used if you're doing some VFX in post-production and whatnot. And you really need the most detailed quality of the scene so that you can track your objects properly and things like that. Before we jump into ProRes settings, since I have to reboot the camera, I just want to mention these two at the very end. Pre-record is an awesome option, especially if you really have to act quickly and hit the record button so that you don't miss a moment. If you enable pre-record, you can actually set a different duration of how long you want this as high as 10 seconds in slow motion and a little and a little bit less in other modes and Komodo will constantly record two seconds of time and keep on overwriting it over and over again so the moment you press record button you will already have the previous two seconds added to your clip this is a very awesome thing especially if you're maybe waiting for dolphins to swim out of the ocean or a whale to flip or something like that. I personally don't use it because most things that I'm shooting are waiting for me and I'm not waiting for them. And then in the slate settings, you can change your camera ID and position without having to actually format your card. As I mentioned earlier in the media menu, when you're doing formatting, you're setting your camera ID and the position. If you ever want to change your camera ID and the position in the middle of the shoot so that your clip names are stored differently, this is where you would actually Actually go to do it on the fly and then these clip names would actually change to something else the reason why you would want to do that is if you're changing a shot or the scene and you want to distinguish between those different scenes based on your file names now let's go and change our file format from red raw to ProRes so I can show you all the other settings when you do this it requires a camera reboot 30 seconds later we are back in the game so as you can see we are now shooting in 2K79, it kept my aspect ratio that I set last time, but we are shooting in ProRes 42HQ. So let's go back here into the project settings and you will see that now we don't have the red quality option anymore because our file format is set to ProRes. So let's actually go and set this to the maximum 6K resolution. Our project time base can be whatever we choose. And then in the ProRes, you can see that we can go as high as 4K. However, when Komodo shoots ProRes, it uses the full sensor. It does not actually crop in. So what you're getting here in this 4K file is actually a 6K image downscaled to 4K. And then we can choose the quality. We can either do ProRes 42HQ or ProRes 42. And you can choose what's baked in. You can shoot ProRes in red-white gamut so that you can apply your LUTs and color grading and everything else later on, or you can actually shoot ProRes with an image and a LUT already applied. So if you're wondering where do we set up the image and a LUT setting, well that is of course done in the very first option in the Komodo menu at the very top. So under image and LUTs, if we go almost all the way down to the 3D LUT, as you can see when I enable the 3D LUT, this icon becomes white and when I disable it, it becomes grayed out. So if we want to actually bake in the LUT onto our ProRes image when we're shooting in ProRes, we can simply enable this and then choose the LUT that we want, hit select and that would be it. Your LUTs can be in camera and Komodo can store probably over 10,000 different LUTs in memory on camera or you can have them on your media. So if we go in camera, these are all the LUTs I have and just like with your presets and other settings, you can actually export all these LUTs onto your media so that you can back them up. Or if you have any LUTs on your media, you can import one or import all of them directly into camera's memory. Now that we have selected LUT, when we record in ProRes, this LUT will be baked in. If however, we go back to project settings, and tell it to record in red-white gamut, ProRes will be recording in red-white gamut with no LUT applied. Let's go back to this image LUT. The very first setting at the top is your ISO. If you're recording in ProRes, your ISO will be baked in, same as the white balance. 
However, if you're recording in Red Raw, ISO, white balance, and all the other things are just metadata. This is your shutter angle. We talked about that one earlier. While we talked about white balance earlier, I do want to mention just one extra setting that is available in this menu, which is not necessarily available when you select the shortcut here, and that is tint. If you have lights on the set that do not actually emit pure white light, this is the setting that you can actually change to adjust and compensate for that. So if your image is maybe too green or too magenta, this is where you can go and adjust the tint so that you can fix the issues with lights not actually being pure white. And again, just a metadata setting when shooting in RAW, you can adjust this later or adjust it while you're shooting. And the very last setting in the white balance is a really useful one. You can put your 18% medium gray card right in front of the Komodo lens and uh, hit auto white balance. Komodo will actually scan that image and adjust the white balance automatically. We can also apply DCI P3, Rec 709, Rec 2020 for HDR, and also red white gamut, which is red raw without any IPP2 processing. If you're shooting in ProRes, this color space will be baked in. However, if you're shooting in red raw, again, this is simply metadata. Output tone map is what you want your contrast to be directly out of the camera. By default, when I shoot with my Komodo, I like it set to at least a medium contrast. However, you also have high contrast or no output tone map whatsoever. When it comes to highlights, none means that there is no compression applied to the image highlights. Hard is the highest compression applied, medium is medium, soft is the soft compression applied to the image highlights, this is the default in camera, and very soft is the lightest compression that can be applied to image highlights. These two settings, output tone map and highlight roll off, as I mentioned with all the other ones, on red these are not baked in. So when you're recording in red raw, you can actually import your footage into your uh, editor at the end of the day and change these while you are editing your video. So don't uh, worry too much about making a wrong decision. Simply go out and shoot and then when you import your footage, go and play with these options and see which one you like the most. I personally love the output tone map to be with a medium contrast and highlight roll off to be set to very soft and I think it provides me a very nice looking image out of this camera with very very nice and super detailed highlights. When it comes to display presets menu this is the gamma of the displayed image setting. It allows you to select the gamma for the camera recording. The options are SDR for standard dynamic range, HDR for high dynamic range and the hybrid log gamma. 3D LUTs we mentioned when we were changing the LUTs earlier. This next to last setting, or CDL, is a color decision list, or a metadata file format used to exchange standard color correction information between post-production tools. If you don't know what it means, you probably don't have to use it. However, since RED is a professional cinema grade camera, of course it supports CDLs. And any of these CDL settings are again just metadata on RED, so they can be changed in post-production whenever you want to. And the very last setting here in the image and LUT menu is the exposure adjust. Here you can actually go and adjust your exposure of the camera sensor, the sensitivity to light from minus one to one. Personally, I don't really mess with this one, I just leave it at zero, and then when I want to change exposure, I actually use the other camera settings like my ISO, my iris, and my shutter speed. And that's a wrap. I believe I've touched on every single setting there is in this camera. If I've missed anything, please definitely let me know in the comments below. And if I can go into more detail somehow about any other setting, definitely ask and I will deliver. So hope you enjoyed this. If you made it this far, I thank you for it. And then I hope you enjoyed and that you learned something new and, and that this helps you in some way. If anything else, I hope it at least uh, killed the boredom. So thank you again, please like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one soon.